We're very honored this hour to have with us Brother Terry Jones from the Pennsboro Church of Christ in Pennsboro, West Virginia. Brother Jones is married to Melinda uh, and was married in uh, August 10th of 1985. He has two sons, Austin, who is married to Jillian, and Quentin, who is married to Tabitha. Brother Jones is a 1986 graduate of the East Tennessee, East Tennessee School of Preaching in Knoxville. Uh, he also received his his uh, AA and his BA degrees from a High Valley College in 1996. He's very active in the church. He also serves as an elder over at the Pennsboro Church of Christ. He's very active with also uh, West Virginia Christian Youth Camp as well as West Virginia Christian as he writes articles for them. We're thankful for him and I know the school was indeed thankful for his presence and his ability to come here uh, each quarter and teach uh, different classes to both our first and second year your students. He's an outstanding teacher, and I think his excellence in teaching can be seen uh, through the growth of the students that sits through his class, and we are very thankful uh, for his time, his patience, and his expertise that he brings to this school and his willingness to preach and teach the gospel of Christ. With that in mind, Brother Jones, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Scott. I feel a little bit, bit like that boy that fell into the barrel of chocolate and his prayer was, Lord, help my tongue to be equal to the task. And that's what I feel like today. It's a great assembly. It's a great occasion. Certainly a great uh, text to deal with today. And it is my prayer that my tongue will be equal to the task. A couple of times this week and again really in the last hour, I have heard it mentioned, in directly or indirectly, that Luke penned two New Testament books, not only the gospel that bears, bears his name and is the subject of our focus this week, but also the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, we find him stating these words, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth of the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Here we find that Luke helps us to know and to understand in a nutshell everything that Jesus' life was all about. If you could summarize what Jesus did while he was on this earth, I believe it would be found in Acts 10 and verse 38 when he points out that Jesus went about doing good. Wherever Jesus was, whatever the occasion was, whatever the circumstance was, no matter whom he was with, that which he did, it was always good. Jesus had in mind the benefit of those around him, whether it be by those words that he spoke, whether it be by those miracles that he performed, whether it be by those compassionate deeds that he could do to help those around him. Whatever the circumstance necessitated, we find that Jesus was interested in doing whatever he could to help those that are around him. And I believe that says volumes about the compassion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus was a great man of passion. And I believe that that is more than sufficiently pointed out in the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And I would direct your attention to that passage. If you haven't opened your Bible to Luke chapter 7 yet, I would encourage you to do that very thing. Because in the seventh chapter of the book of Luke, we find that it provides with us, for us a heartwarming picture of our Lord's compassion upon those that are hurting. In this particular chapter, we notice that as, as it begins, we see Jesus' compassion upon the sick as he healed the centurion servant at Capernaum in verses 1 through 10. And then as you progress on to Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17, we see Jesus' compassion upon the sorrowing as he raised the widow of Nain's son from the dead. And then in verses 18 through 35, we see Jesus' compassion upon the suffering 
as we find that as, uh, he sent that message to John who was inquiring about him. And in verse 22, we see that Jesus said to them, Go and tell John the things that you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. The compassion of Jesus overwhelms us as we think of all that he did. But that brings us to our text for today. As Luke chapter 7 closes out, verses 36 through 50, we see the compassion of Jesus upon the sinful. In those verses, we find an occasion where Jesus was invited into the house of a Pharisee for supper. And as they were there... We find that the Bible tells us that there was a woman, a sinful woman, that came to Jesus and stood at his feet weeping. And she washed his feet with her tears and she wiped them with her hair and anointed his feet with precious oil. There are two sinners on this occasion. And we learn how that Jesus dealt with these two sinners in a compassionate way. One was a man, the other was a woman. One was overly haughty and resisted Christ. The other was overwhelmed by sin and received Christ. One demonstrated an attitude of fault finding and lacked respect for the Lord. And the other demonstrated faith and love for the Lord. As we examine this text, I want us to keep one thing in mind. The thing that I'd like for us to think and focus on this day, as we look at this text and we see the compassion of Jesus, as we see, <clears throat> excuse me, as we see and observe how he dealt with these two sinners, I want us to remember this. He loved them both. He loved them both. To Zacchaeus, in Luke 19 and verse 10. Jesus said, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. And in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, the Brother Randy expounded upon so eloquently earlier today. We find there that Jesus told those parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son. And what is the point of all of those parables? It is the fact that every soul is precious, every soul is valuable. And Jesus said that he came into the world to seek and to save the precious souls that are lost. And we find Jesus in this particular setting on this occasion. And he loved. He loved them. And he was there that he might save them. As we turn our attention to the text today, from these 15 verses, there are seven things that I'd like to emphasize for our consideration this hour. Let us begin with the fact that Jesus is eating with Simon. There are two things that we find in Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. As the text there says that one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and he sat down to eat. And there are two things about this Pharisee that we notice here who has identified with the name of Simon in the text. Let us notice first of all Simon's identity. Luke identifies this man as a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the strictest sect of the Jews. And they were a people that were very hostile to Jesus. As a matter of fact, Phillips describes it this way when he says, and I quote, No group of men were more consistently hostile to, to Christ than the Pharisees. And then he goes on to say, Luke mentions them 28 times and always as being hostile to Jesus. Now I want us to think about that. We know that Jesus had several run-ins with the Pharisees. And it's very clearly noted in the gospel accounts. And it's sad that the greatest opposition that Jesus faced was the, with the religious leaders of that day. Ironically and sadly isn't the case that nothing has changed in all of this time. 
that Jesus is still in opposition with many of the religious leaders of today. Denominationalism and world religions have rejected Christ and His Holy Word in order that they might selfishly practice the damnable doctrines of men. The Pharisees were a wicked lot consumed by the prospect of entrapping Jesus so that they can condemn Him to death. And from among them, this man, this man emerged to interact with Jesus on this occasion. In verse 40, Jesus addressed him by the name Simon. And we see that he is one of nine men in the New Testament by that particular common name. The second thing that we notice here is Simon's invitation. The Bible here points out that he went to this Pharisee's house to sit, to sit down and eat. And he did so because Simon asked him to do so. It's interesting to entertain the question as to why this Pharisee would invite Jesus Jesus to dinner at his house. If it's the case that Pharisees are typically in opposition to Jesus, why did this Pharisee invite Jesus into his house to sit down and eat with him? Luke records two other occasions where Jesus is invited to dinner by a Pharisee. One of those is in Luke chapter 11 and verse 37. The other in Luke 14 and verse 1. It is interesting to note that both of those instances resulted in clashes between Jesus and the Pharisees. So what might have been the motive behind Simon's invitation on this occasion? Hendrickson provides some good insight to this, I think, as he asked the question, why did he extend the invitation? He says, we are not told. Verses 44 to 46 clearly indicate, however, that he did not do so out of love or even high regard for Jesus. He may have even been motivated by curiosity. He goes on to say that even the possibility that he wanted to have an opportunity to find a basis for formulating a charge against Jesus cannot be entirely excluded. And so, we don't know why this invitation was given. We know that it wasn't because he was thinking about nominating Jesus for Man of the Year. I like Wayne Jackson's observation of this when he said, His motive is not revealed. We can surmise, however, that at best it was mixed. At least he was curious to know more and Jesus loved him for it. Simon offered the invitation. Amazingly, Jesus accepted the invitation. I think that if it were you and I, that we'd have to think very seriously, maybe long and hard before we said yes to this invitation, noting the track record of the past. But Simon offered and Jesus accepted. We may not know the motive of this Pharisee, but Jesus certainly did. Whether it was for good or for ill, Jesus knew what the motive and the intention was behind the invitation. Simon might not have had the best of intentions, but Jesus entered into his house anyway. Paul Butler made this observation. He said, although Jesus despised the attitudes of most of the Pharisees, he never refused an opportunity to try to convert one. Now, if we're looking for a lesson to take from this today, maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. Maybe there's some folks in your life that maybe you don't see eye to eye with on everything. Maybe you don't get along with all that well. Maybe they don't treat you all that well. But no matter what the circumstance, we ought to try to take advantage of every opportunity to convert every person we con come into contact with in this life. The second thing that we notice here is the entrance of a sinner at this dinner. In verses 37 and 38, the Bible tells us, Behold a woman in the city who was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. When Jesus sat down to eat, Luke tells us that a woman in the city entered the house and the woman now becomes the focus of all who were in the house. Try to imagine if you would that you're in the house of this Pharisee. Pharisee was a leader among the Jews. 
And there were probably some elite people that were gathered that also had been invited there. And here comes this woman. This woman who had a reputation as a sinner. And she comes into the midst. She was uninvited. And yet, she entered the house. And she came straight to the guest of honor at this house. And though she's not identified by name, there are four things that I think can help us here to help us to understand more about this woman from these two verses. Let us notice number one, the plight of this woman. The Bible says, Behold a woman in the city who was a sinner. This woman had been plagued by sin. She lived a sinful life. This verse begins with an exclamatory statement, and that statement is, and behold. Whenever you read that statement in the New Testament, typically the author is trying to focus somebody's attention on something in particular. Not just a little glance, but a noticing, a particular focus being put upon that thing. And here we see that Luke says, and behold. It is as though Luke wants to direct our focus squarely upon the entrance of this woman. And he identifies this woman specifically as a sinner. Now we're not told precisely the nature of her sin. However, this woman being identified as a sinner, often that phrase implies the sin of harlotry. And although we're not told we would think that that very likely could be the case. But whatever the case may be here, this woman had a notorious reputation as a sinner in this city. The second thing that we notice here is the present from this woman. She came bearing a gift for Jesus. Apparently she had previously heard the preaching of Jesus and it is believed that she had received the forgiveness of her sins. This produced an intense desire within her heart to express her deep appreciation to her Lord for lifting that overwhelming burden of sin. The present that she brought to Jesus was an alabaster flask of oil or ointment. It was not cheap old ordinary olive oil, but rather it was a very expensive perfumed ointment. And the sincerity in this woman's heart is certainly demonstrated by the extravagant presence that she brought and gave to Jesus. She wanted to do something for Jesus. She wanted to show the gratitude in her heart for all that he meant to her. But then let us notice thirdly, the posture of this woman. The Bible says in verse 38 that she stood at the feet of him. Notice the posture that she took. She stood. When she came in, she didn't go to the head of Jesus. She went to the foot of Jesus, and she stood behind him. And so upon entering the house, she went straight to Jesus, and Luke states that she stood at his feet behind him. As was the custom of the day, Jesus would have been reclining on a couch with his head next to the table, probably leaning on his left elbow, with his feet reclined away from the table. And she came to that point. She came to where Jesus' feet was, and she stood at his feet. The posture of this woman speaks volumes about her humility and the reverence that she had in the presence of Jesus. The fourth thing that we notice here about her is that we can easily see the piety of this woman. We notice here that verse 38 provides us with a great description of this woman's piety and her reverence toward Jesus Christ. Luke says that she stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and she anointed them with the fragrant oil. And Luke gives us great insight into this woman's piety by giving us a five-fold description of what she did in Jesus' presence. Let us notice, number one, the fact that this woman was weeping at the feet of Jesus. As she stood in the presence of the one who forgave all of her sins. She was overcome by emotion, and tears began to flow from her weeping eyes. These were tears. They were real tears. They were genuine tears. They were tears, I believe, that were born out of, number one, a, an appreciation for the forgiveness of her sins and the lifting of that overwhelming burden in her life. 
but they're also tears of repentance and the weeping and the sorrow that she experienced as she reflected upon the sinful life that she had lived and how that she lived in such a shameful way. And now she shows the fruits of repentance. I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, where Paul said, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. This is genuine sorrow that we see in this woman. And as she's in the presence of Jesus, she's standing at His feet, and she is weeping, and tears are flowing from her eyes. Second, let us notice this woman as she is washing the feet of Jesus. The tears flowing from this weeping woman's eyes fell on the feet of the forgiver of her sins. With her tears, she began to wash the feet of the one who with his blood would ultimately wash away her sins. Thirdly, let us notice this woman wiping the feet of Jesus with her hair. She's no longer standing. She's now stooping at the feet of Jesus. As though the actions of this woman to this point were not extraordinary enough, she now does something even more astonishing. And that is, she let down the tresses of her hair, and she used her hair to wipe the feet of Jesus. You know, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 15, But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Paul points out that a woman's hair is her glory. It is a glory to her. And this woman broke tradition by letting down her hair in public, but then she sacrificed her glory by using her hair to wash and then wipe the dirty feet of her Lord. Fourthly, we see this woman worshiping at the feet of Jesus. The Bible tells us that she kissed His feet. That's certainly an act of worship. A.T. Robertson in his word pictures of the New Testament says that the word kissed here is the imperfect active of the Greek word katafileo. And it means to kiss repeatedly. That certainly is in line with what Jesus will later say over in verse 45 when he says to Simon, you gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time that I came in. She washed Jesus' feet with her tears and then she showered them with her kisses. And then fifthly, we notice this woman waxing the feet of Jesus with that precious ointment. She waxed the feet of Jesus, anointing them with the expensive ointment that she brought. Butler says, This woman did the most humiliating, servile deed to Jesus that could customarily be done in that era, while at the same time gladly rubbed on His feet the most expensive and precious thing that she possessed. Matthew Henry said, Having been converted from her wicked course of life by His preaching, she came to acknowledge her obligations to Him, having no opportunity of doing it in any other way than by washing His his feet and anointing them with the sweet ointment that she brought with her for that purpose. This woman was making a tremendous sacrifice to the Lord and she did that at the feet of Jesus by anointing His feet with this very expensive oil. Notice the sacrifice that this woman made. If it's the case that her sin was that of harlotry, this would have been an important part of her previous occupation. I believe that she shows signs and fruits of repentance here and that she has taken that precious ointment. She no longer needs it for its intended purpose. And now she turns that into a sacrifice to anoint the feet of Jesus. Think about the expensive gift that it was. Think about the sacrifice that she would make. Sometimes serving the Lord requires, demands, and necessitates sacrifice on our part. 
You know, David understood that. In the 24th chapter of the book of 2 Samuel, in verse 24, when David was negotiating to buy Arana's threshing floor that he might make sacrifices, listen to what he said. He said, Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. Far too many folks are interested in cheap sacrifice or no sacrifice to the Lord. Too many folks want all the blessings of salvation, all the blessings of being a child of God, all the blessings of being a member of the Lord's body, but then want to have nothing to do with service in the kingdom. Not willing to make the sacrifice necessary to be a faithful child of God. But you know, we will not serve much, nor will we serve well if we're not willing to sacrifice for the Lord. Jesus sacrificed His all for us. He sacrificed His all for our salvation, and therefore we ought to be willing to sacrifice some possessions or some time or some honor or some money for Him. This woman was willing to sacrifice the unmistakable piety of this woman is abundantly evidenced here. In the third place, here we see Simon examining the scene. In verse 39, in verse 39, it says, And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him. For she is a sinner. Let's notice two things here. Number one, let us notice what Simon saw. We notice that this woman obviously drew attention to herself by her audible weeping and her adoring worship at the feet of Jesus. And these actions did not escape the observing eye of the host. And in his observation here, as he looked upon that scene, as he examined the actions of this woman and the response of Jesus, let's notice what he said to himself. He said in his mind, this man cannot be a prophet. If he were a prophet, he would know what manner of woman this is who is touching him. A Pharisee would have never let this woman get so close as to touch them. Well, let us notice that Simon revealed some things about himself in this statement. Number one, I want us to notice that he revealed by what he said his irreverence and an irreverent attitude toward Jesus. His irreverence is revealed by his saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know what manner of woman this is. You see, in his mind, the Pharisee was irreverent in his treatment of Jesus in two ways. First of all, let us notice that he was irreverent toward Christ by denying his deity. He simply called Jesus this man. Just like in this text, this woman is referred to as this woman. And Simon is basically putting Jesus in the same arena when he refers to Jesus as this man. This is not a term of respect, and it denies the deity of Christ. I want you to think about this for a minute. Here is a man who would not even say the name Jesus in his thoughts. Even in his mind, he referred to Jesus as just simply this man. Secondly, we see that his irreverent attitude toward Jesus Jesus by denying his discernment. He refused to recognize Christ as a prophet. And you know, an attribute of prophets was that of discernment, the ability to discern things. But Simon was going to learn quickly that Jesus was more than just a man and certainly more than a prophet. In the second place, what Simon said revealed that he was ignorant about this woman he was ignorant. In accusing Jesus of not knowing what manner of woman this is, 
Notice here that Simon revealed his ignorance of the change in this woman's heart and life because of Christ. Surely this man ought to have been able to see in this woman's actions the fruits of repentance that were evident in her life. But yet he couldn't get past the fact that all he'd known her as was a sinner. And Simon was going to learn quickly the things had changed in her life. Yes, she had been a sinner, but she had also been forgiven. And now she's demonstrating the fruits of repentance. And Simon needed the same forgiveness that this woman had received. But the problem was he didn't realize that he himself needed that forgiveness. Nor did he realize that the one who could provide that forgiveness was sitting at his dining room table. Many today have access to that salvation just like Simon did and yet fail to receive it. Many have access to the gospel. Many have heard the gospel of Christ proclaimed. Many have access to a Bible where they can read it for themselves. And yet, in spite of that, refuse to be obedient to the gospel that Jesus has given. Many are much like Felix. Oh, Governor Felix, over in Acts chapter 24 and in verse 25, when the Apostle Paul preached to him of righteousness and temperance and the judgment to come, the Bible says that Felix trembled and he said, Go thy way, and when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. How many folks today are procrastinating just like Felix did? How many folks today know the gospel plan of salvation, know the sinful life that they've lived and the need for forgiveness that they have, and one day they intend to do that. One day they intend to come to Jesus. One day they intend to receive the forgiveness that he has to offer when that convenient season comes. But brethren, when does that convenient season come? Far too often, it is never. Some are like King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. King Agrippa said to Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. How many folks in our day, how many folks do you know who are almost persuaded and have been almost persuaded for who knows how long. But almost persuaded is not enough. It's by the fact that we live in a world that teaches us and tries to get us to see and understand that almost is good enough, right? That's what faith only salvation is all about. Just get in the ballpark. Just do something. Just say the name of Jesus. Just do something. And Jesus will save you. But King Agrippa is proof positive as well as Felix, that almost is not enough. And as the song says, it's just almost but lost. I'm reminded of the very beginning of this gospel in Luke 1 and verse 1, where Luke says, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which are most surely believed among us. And then in verse 4, he says that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. When we know with certainty those things in which we have been instructed, we should not be almost persuaded, but completely and fully persuaded. And having been overwhelmed by sin in our life, we should be overcome by the blood of Jesus Christ, by being buried in the waters of baptism, that we might be forgiven of those sins and have them washed away, that we might arise to walk in newness of life, that we too could have the burden of sin lifted from us. Thirdly, we see that Simon revealed his inconsistency. Simon was not in a position to criticize this woman because he himself was guilty. He was not in a position to call this woman a sinner when he himself had failed to do the things that he ought to do in offering the common courtesies for Jesus as he invited him into his house as his honored guest. The woman was doing those things that needed to be done to Christ. She was washing and wiping and anointing the feet of Jesus. But instead of acknowledging his own faults, we see that Simon criticizes others for their alleged faults. He's criticizing Jesus here. And he's criticizing this woman 
And he's being a hypocrite in so doing. You see, this is typical of a hypocrite. And how often the hypocrite criticizes others in the same area in which he is greatly at fault. Many, many years ago, I heard an older gospel preacher say, if you ever hear a preacher that's often preaching against and condemning a particular sin and doing it with some regularity, that you need to beware. <laughs> beware that perhaps he himself is guilty of the same sin. And sure enough, he was. This man was being hypocritical. He was being hypocritical in that which he was doing on that occasion. Reminds me of the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, beginning in verse 1, when Jesus said, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? For how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck out of your eye? And look, a plank is in your own eye, hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. Here we find that Simon is in that very same condition. Here it is. He's got this plank sticking out of his own eye. And what is he doing? He's looking at this woman and calling her a sinner. He's looking at Jesus and condemning him for allowing this woman to touch him. While at the same time, he had invited Jesus into his home. And what did he do? He did not offer to Jesus the common courtesies which he should have given. Let's notice in the next place. Jesus enlightening him with a story. Verses 40 to 43. Although Simon spoke to himself, Jesus read his mind. Jesus knew what he had said. And now Jesus was going to show Simon how wrong that he was because he knew all about him and he knew all about this woman. He begins by addressing this Pharisee in verse 40. Jesus spoke directly to this Pharisee and called him by name. That which Jesus is about to teach specifically is for Simon's benefit. This Pharisee had a very high social and religious status, but that did not keep Jesus from rebuking his sin. Secondly, we see Jesus announcing a parable here in verses 41 and 42. There the Bible says, Jesus said, there was a certain creditor had, who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? So Jesus introduced his stunning rebuke of Simon by telling this parable. One of the, these debtors owed ten times more than the other, which is really irrelevant because neither one of them had an ability to pay. Irrelevant in the standpoint of payment. Neither one of them could pay. Even though one owed much less, he didn't have any more ability to pay than the one who owed much more. It matters not how big or how little of a sinner we may be. None have the ability to pay even the debt or payment of one single sin. I can't. All the world cannot pay the debt for one single sin. But Jesus paid our debt for us. Jesus' question to Simon was, which of them will love him more? And that brings us to his answer in verse 43. Verse 43 says, Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And Jesus said to him, you have rightly judged. I want you to think about the answer here. You know, it's easy to detect, I believe, the disdain in Simon's answer. He says, notice what he says, well, I suppose. I, I suppose it's the one who owed more. It's interesting to me that Jesus didn't address the attitude of Simon here. 
But he commands him. He says, you have rightly answered. You have answered correctly. No wonder Jesus said of these Jewish leaders in Matthew 21 and verse 31, Verily, verily, I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. In spite of his proud attitude, Jesus acknowledged that he had answered correctly. Let us notice then in fifth place an exposition of the Savior. Jesus exposes this Pharisee for what he was, verses 44 to 48. He begins with a contrast here in verses 44 to 46. Verse 44 says, he turned to the woman and he said to Simon. Notice, he turned to the woman and he said to Simon. He turned to the woman, but he said to Simon. He's looking at the woman, but he's talking to Simon. And he says to Simon, do you see this woman? Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has ceased not to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. I can't help but to think about the fact here that when this Pharisee looked upon this woman, that's all he saw her as, as a woman, and she was a sinner. And Jesus emphasized this woman, this woman, this woman, she may have been a sinner. She may not be a Pharisee. She might not have power. She might not have a, a, a lot of things. She might not have the social class and the social status and the authority that you have. But this woman, look at what this woman has done. And he contrasts that with what Simon had done. Certainly Simon had seen this woman. He'd already judged Jesus for not knowing that she was a sinner. He had seen the woman, but only had he seen her through his haughty, hypocritical, and pharisaical eyes. Then Jesus proceeded to chastise Simon for his bad manners, as well as his poor hospitality. And he says to her that you provided no water for my feet, no kiss of greeting, and no oil for my head. And by pointing out these omissions in hospitality, Jesus exposed the true character of this woman. Jesus doesn't deny here that this woman is sinful, but he does draw attention to the fact that she is sorrowful. Notice the conclusion. In verse number 47, Jesus said, Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. After drawing this sharp contrast between Simon and this woman, Jesus said that whom little is forgiven... He loves little. Because of Simon's failure to recognize his own sin, and Jesus as the one who could forgive sin, he sought no forgiveness. Then we see the confirmation that Jesus gives to this woman in verse 48 when he says to her, your sins are forgiven. I'm wondering here if Jesus did not say this for Simon's benefit. If he did not just say this on this occasion so that Simon would understand and know for a certainty this woman had received the forgiveness of her sins. In the next place, we see him entertaining a solution. In verse 49, the Bible says, And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Just as Jesus was able to know the heart of Simon when he spoke to himself, he was aware of the question as he was asked in the heart of the other guests as well. They knew that only God could forgive sins, and now they are wrestling with this idea that Jesus is claiming deep for himself as one who is able to forgive sins. Jesus said it clearly in John 10 and verse 30 when he says, I and my Father are one. And then in verse number 50, we see him ensuring her salvation. He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The love of Jesus has been pressed upon the heart of this woman. She responded by faith. She responded in obedience. And she responded in love for Jesus. And as as a result, Jesus says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And I submit to you that that's the only way that peace can be enjoyed. 
that is, through the forgiveness of sins and having one's sins forgiven. Let us notice that sin is a man's greatest problem, and Jesus is the answer. Those who come to Jesus by faith will be saved, and those who reject Christ will be eternally lost. Jesus said in Mark 16 and verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. The passage that we have considered today in this study demonstrates both of those attitudes. Jesus was able to save this sinful woman because she was willing to repent and she was willing to follow him. But the Pharisee could not see sin in his own life and he did not feel the need for forgiveness. The message of our text is magnificently summarized in that great old hymn that says, Sinners, Jesus will receive. Sound this word of grace to all who the heavenly pathway lead, all who linger, all who fall. Sing it o'er and o'er again, Christ receiveth sinful men. Make the message clear and plain, Christ receiveth sinful men. Thank you.